The WNBA, it is the most famous women's professional league in the United States and among the most famous in the world. It started way back in 1996 as an experiment and expansion by the NBA. It has since seen a great deal of growth, but has grown a bad reputation among fans of the NBA. And it relies on the NBA to help pay its players and its bills. Nearly 30 years since its inception, it remains to be seen if the NBA's long-term investment and experiment will pay off. I say all this contrasts it with the NFL's relationship with women's football, which is to say, non-existent. There's no officially sponsored or funded professional women's football league. All efforts to make women's football reality have been grassroots efforts for and by independent businessmen and women with little intervention by the NFL throughout its history. As a disclaimer, this early period of women's football contains very few sources, so apologies in advance if this early history seems rather bare bones. I was able to find enough to create a somewhat coherent timeline. There's evidence of women playing American football all the way back in the 1880s, usually within the context of academia. This is also the origin of the so-called powder puff football, as the media at the time would often report women football games and events as powder bowls. One of these powder bowls was played at Soldiers Harlem River Park in New York during 1898. It would become a bloody and intense contest, only ending with the police being called. This early contest would help fight the image that women's football was just some dainty sideshow or gimmick. Later in the 20th century, we find women's football leagues across the United States in high schools and some of the faculty members of colleges. There would be a women's football game played during the halftime of the NFL championship of 1926, but rather than a true contest, it seems to have just been a comedy act rather than the official start to women's football. Despite some negative portrayals, women's football would explode in popularity in the 1930s with local women's football leagues starting and ending in states such as California, Ohio, Illinois, and others. Many of these leagues would end due to pressure from media and societal standards for women, despite many spectators claiming they would compete and play just as tough as the men did. After the great pushbacks of the 1930s against women in gridiron football, the first major league, the Women's Professional Football League, would emerge in 1965. This league was founded by Sid Freeman, a town agent in Cleveland who would also put on beauty pageants and would last in less than a decade. He wanted something similar to the Harlem Globetrotters, with more of a focus on showmanship than actual football, but his mind was quickly changed as he saw the determination and competitiveness of the female athletes. This league would create the famous Toledo Troopers. If any of you know anything about women's football, there's no doubt you've heard of the Troopers' reign of terror. The Troopers would win several championships and become the winningest team in women's football. The National Women's Football League would follow up in 1974, lasting about 14 years until it dissolved. It was created as a successor to Sid Freeman's experiment. This league would produce the likes of Linda Jefferson of the aforementioned Toledo Troopers, one of the most famous semi-professional female athletes of all time. Other stories connected to the league help showcase the sport's roots, especially within the LGBT community, with teams such as the Dallas Blue Bonnets being founded in and connected to lesbian bars. The successor league was truly a grassroots effort by women, for women, to play one of America's greatest inventions. Despite some success, the NWFL would fail because of financial reasons and refusal to pay their women players. This would also be the nail in the coffin for many future leagues. The NWFL would be the last significant women's football league until the independent women's football league in the modern era. In the modern era, our story begins with the now defunct independent women's football league. It began back in 2000, with it being founded by players on the charter team, the Austin Outlaws. From the start, it was a tumultuous time. In fact, most of the period between its founding until its last season in 2019 has had very few sources and documents. From what I was able to discover about the league's early days, the IWFL's teams largely played in high school stadiums and some repurposed college baseball stadiums. And unlike most leagues of the past, there was no promise of being paid to play. Players would have to pay $500 to play in this league, and there's a requirement of almost $6,000 just to start up a team. Due to these high costs, a player named Lisa King would start a rival league called the Women's Football Association in 2009. This would start a decade-long Cold War, the so-called two-league era. 
the WFA would use sponsorships to lessen the financial burdens of their players and lower team startup costs to $2,000. Soon players and even entire franchises would begin moving into this league, including many charter teams like the Austin Outlaws. Bad blood between the two increased as the years passed, with talks emerging the two leagues being immediately shut down. As a response to the WFA's lower cost of entry, the IWFL began to lower its own prices to start a team, leading to an explosion of teams across the country. Naturally, this oversaturated the market with around three to five teams being present in most major cities across the U.S. All of this chaos culminated in the dissolution of the IWFL in 2018, with most of the remaining teams disbanding or going to the WFA. This tumultuous era was a dark age for the sport, bringing it to its lowest levels since the pushbacks against women's football in the 1930s. The chaos didn't end in 2018. Yet another league was formed in the same year as the demise of the IWFL under the name Women's National Football Conference. Five teams from the IWFL were absorbed into this new league, and this league is unique in that it requires no payment by amateur players or fees to create a team. Rather, it claims to pick teams based on their market and players based on their ability. It is able to do this largely because of sponsorships, the largest being Adidas. Their She Breaks Barriers initiative was launched in 2017 and sought to narrow the gap of media coverage between men's and women's sports. It's because of these mainstream sponsorships it has become the most stable women's football league. But calling yourself the most stable women's football league is like calling yourself the tallest midget. Since its founding, teams have been disbanded, dissolved, and other teams have left for the WFA. This is often attributed by former players as effects of mismanagement and other financial problems. To this day, despite their sponsorship money, there is no official stadium. Teams often have to play at local high school stadiums or at community centers. Despite these setbacks, they do report having some level of success streaming through a network called Vire. It remains to be seen if they can continue to be a major rival to the WFA. The Women's Football Association Despite being founded in the start of the dark age of women's football, they remain the largest and oldest active league. Since its inception, the number of active teams has fluctuated between 40 and 70, with it currently fielding 59 teams across three divisions. It reached its lowest point in the years leading up to the dissolution of the IWFL. After the death of the IWFL, the WFA saw its greatest gains in its troubled history. They landed broadcasts of their biggest games on the ESPN2 and ESPN3 channels and also began to play more games at local colleges rather than high schools. The company Fathead, a sports merch store which also services the WNBA, signed a multi-million dollar deal with the WFA, pouring even more capital into the league. Perhaps the biggest news were the direct interventions by the NFL in the now promising league, allowing them to play championship games in Canton at the Tom Benson Hall of Fame field. An aptly named show called Road to Canton broadcast the stories of players and teams within the WFA on their way to claim a championship ring. While this show, which can be found on Roku and YouTube, is a useful source for news related to the WFA, it can be difficult to watch at times. Wait, what? I don't know where she is. She's not here. Alexa, we have a problem. She's not here. What do we do? Call Aline Hamlin on the double now. Did you say Allie Hamlin? Did you not hear me? Yes, girl, call her right now. Okay, on the way. I've seen her and she eats a lot. So I think that if you were looking for her, you probably could find her with some kind of food. Well, one thing I know about her is that uh, she talks a lot. Like, she, she talks a lot. And she's always talking. Mostly about football. So, like, um, she cries a lot. Like, she's pretty dramatic. Do you have any pancakes, you think? No! I saw some Despite its tumultuous past and questionable advertising, the future is hopeful as it continues to distance itself from the era of two leagues, perhaps the darkest era for women's football. 
Those of you with knowledge of obscure football lore may have noticed I glossed over another notable women's football league. We'll talk about this elephant in the room now. This is the women's football league that has had the most media coverage, and the one your pops or grandfather watched when they forgot you were in the room. This is the X League, originally known as the Lingerie Football League. Just like the WFA, it was also founded in 2009. Unlike the WFA, its players have always been paid and has had much more media attention, for good and for bad. The concept for a lingerie league first began in 2004 with something called the Lingerie Bowl. This was an alternative pay-per-view show during the Super Bowl's halftime. Basically, it was a bunch of attractive models in bikinis playing football. You could probably see the appeal. The full thing is on YouTube if you want to see some good, fundamental football. They continued to hold the lingerie bowl every year at halftime of the Super Bowl, and later would change it to right before kickoff of the Super Bowl. There was a few hiccups leading up to 2013, however, the year of the final lingerie bowl. The game would have to be canceled or limited due to poor management and even a conflict with a nudist resort. You heard me right, the lingerie league gave clothing requirements to a nudist resort they were hosting the bowl in. In 2009, the league became official and 10 teams were created. They followed the NFL schedule, having games in the fall and winter and played mostly traditional arena football. An advantage they had over the WFA and other women's football leagues was that their coaches were largely former NFL athletes and coaches, which brought further attention to the league. After the so-called bowl era of lingerie football ended in 2013, there was a significant rebrand. They were renamed the Legends Football League and began shifting to a less revealing volleyball style uniform. They also got rid of advertisements and taglines like true fantasy football which to me reminds me of Monster Inc.'s We Scare Because We Care motto. They also distanced themselves from the images of sexy women in their branding. They also quickly expanded into a Canadian and Latin American league, the latter having six teams across Mexico and Brazil. These teams haven't seen the fall of the new uniform requirements of the sister leagues, with them basically wearing the same attire as the old lingerie league. They didn't stop there, however. An additional two leagues in Australia and another league in Europe were established before the league stated they would focus their efforts in the States before overextending themselves. Of course, it wouldn't be women's football without some level of instability. The Legends Football League had a minor league of sorts in Australia called the Ladies Gridiron League, which operated for about a year after the Australian leagues were established before completely cutting ties with the LFL over management issues and financial concerns. It's now its own league, but I can say with reasonable confidence that it's no longer in operation. The Facebook and Twitter have been updated since 2019 and 2020, and it's sadly probably just another business venture that was killed by the pandemic. But the LFL would continue to add and lose teams until 2019, where the final season of the LFL would be played. The league would then go into hiatus and rebrand itself once again as the X League in 2022 with just two games to be played by each team. If you want to watch them live, you better get out your credit card as the only legal way is to their $80 fan pass. Only time will tell if the extensive rebranding will allow the more mainstream success or a similar fate to the leagues of the past. Here's a list of other women's football leagues that didn't quite fit in the modern era section of this video. This is due to how short-lived or undocumented they were. First, we have the National Women's Football Association, which began in 2000 and ended in 2009. Most teams ended up on the IWFL and WFA. It has some interesting rules, such as only requiring one leg inbound to make a reception, and they fielded a youth-sized football. Interestingly, they had some legal run-ins with the NFL while under its original name, the National Women's Football League. The NFL told them to change their name 
as well as some of their team logos due to their similarity to some of their own NFL logos. The Western States Women's Professional Football League, the only source for the existence of this league, is in Wikipedia. The source claims that it began in 1978 and lasted only two years. There's no other information on this mysterious league. Women's Tackle Football Association is similar to the Western States Women's Professional Football League. The Women's Tackle Football Association's only reference is a Wikipedia article which claims it started in 1988 and lasted only two years. Yet another mysterious league. The Women's Professional Football League Not to be confused with Sid Freeman's league of the same name, the Women's Professional Football League started a year before the Independent Women's Football League in 1999. It was founded by Terry Sullivan and Carter Turner, both veterans of minor league football operations, with the Lake Michigan Minks and the Minnesota Vixens as the charter franchises. The reason I didn't include it is because it was much smaller. It only operated two teams in their first year, maxed out at 11 teams, and fluctuated rapidly in number of players and teams. They promised their athletes $100 a game, didn't follow through on this promise, and disintegrated after only a few years. The Women's American Football League was a league founded in 2001, sometimes nicknamed the Waffle League. It was disbanded in 2003, and most teams would go on to join the WFA and IWFL, a significant one being the Minnesota Vixens of the former WPFL, which would go on to win some titles in future leagues. The American Football Women's League, acronymed AWFL, was a one of the shortest-lived women's football leagues in history. It was founded in 2001, lasted less than two years, only fielding at most six teams in the California area. Most teams were disbanded, but the LA Aftershocks managed to find a home within the Women's Professional Football League before it itself was disbanded. The WFA Women's Football Association is not to be confused with the much larger and successful Women's Football Association. This WFA was founded seven years prior in 2002 and folded less than a year later. Most teams simply disbanded, except for the Jackson Dixie Blues, which in itself was founded in a league which had been disbanded prior to joining this version of the WFA. They eventually found a home in the currently active WFA. Blues were a women's professional tackle football team, so we play NFL style football. Um, full pads, full helmet, no lingerie, even though we love a lingerie league. Um, I mean, we have so many different backgrounds. We've got obviously mothers, um, full-time students, we've got firefighters, police officers, I mean we have, we pull from everywhere across the city. What makes it the most difficult is there's no feeder system like there are for boys. I mean you've got high school ball unlimited to where people can, you know, they've been playing since they were young and Pop Warner and we don't have that for women. So we're just looking for athletes. If you have the ability and you have the willingness and potential, that's what the coaches are for. December 12th is actually our final tryout. We've held two previously. Uh, we brought on 13 new girls, and we're looking to fill another 17 spots. The WFL. The Women's Football League began in 2002 and ended in 2007. This league was mostly located in the South and has little information outside of these two facts. However, interestingly, the Jackson Blue Dixies joined the short-lived league before going on to the WFA. Women's Arena Football League. Another Waffle League. It is a women's indoor arena football league which began in 2011 and ended in 2013. Interestingly, it was 8 on 8 football rather than a full 11 on 11 or 7 on 7. It was originally formed as a family friendly alternative to the LFL. Internationally, women's football has gained some level of popularity. The Women's Maple League, in English, is the Finnish Football League. They fielded six teams in the 2022 season and actually have a pretty extensive history going back to 2008. While there is some evidence of the league struggling, it has been mostly stable with only one or two teams being dissolved and added since 2008. There are also several leagues in Mexico, three leagues in Canada, some of which are connected to American leagues, like the WFA, two active leagues in Germany, and two active European leagues. There's also quite a few active leagues in Australia, Sadly, I could not find any Asian-based leagues, but I'll come out with an update if I could find at least one. On an international level, the IFAF sponsors a women's football tournament where the United States completely and utterly obliterates the competition every year. In 2013, for example, they beat Canada in their final match 64-0. to 
It beat Germany in an earlier match by a whopping 107 for 107 to 0. I guess there's no unwritten rules in international women's football. To wrap this extensive video up, I'll quickly hit on some of the highlights of women playing in leagues dominated by men. In 1970, a woman by the name of Patricia Palinkas played professionally as a place kicker for the Orlando Panthers of the Atlantic Coast Football League, a now defunct minor league of American football. Funnily enough, her and her husband tried out as a couple, and her husband was the one who didn't make the cut. Another significant figure, Julie Harshbarger, was a place kicker for the Continental Indoor Football League. She played for several seasons and even won the Most Valuable Player Award in 2014. The NFL Combine in 2013 showcased the first female athlete with Lauren Silberman trying out as a kicker. Sadly, after a few kicks, she was evaluated by medical staff and was not able to complete her remaining kicks. There's also been a rise of female coaches in the NFL. In 2015, Catherine Smith made history by becoming the, the quality control coach for the Bills, becoming the first woman to hold a permanent coaching position in professional football. Callie Browning coached a tight end position for the Browns in 2020, the first woman to hold a position specific coaching job. Today, there are six coaching positions in the NFL held by women, from assistant lineman coaches to strength and conditioning coaches. Women's football has had a tumultuous and chaotic history due to mismanagement, financial woes, societal pressure, and a target on its back that will never be anything more than a gimmick sport. Despite the immense obstacles before it, the female athletes have shown time and time again that this is a sport worth fighting for. Thanks for checking this video out. I'm sure I missed some moments in women's American football, so let me know in the comments what I missed. This is a fun video to make, and no, I sadly, sadly cannot find a 1.6 in the hours and hours of women's football I watched. But I'm not giving up hope. Thanks for all the support. Join the movement, and let's get a 1.6 happening in the NFL, and let's get one happening in the WFA as well.